Thank you and good afternoon everyone uh, for joining this session, the third day of the conference almost towards the end and I hope I don't bore you to death or put you to sleep. Uh, my name is Sumit. Uh, I am based out of Boston, US. I am part of the Ontotex team as a strategic technology director. Ontotex is a company that's based out of um, Sofia, Bulgaria. And I myself have been doing graphs since last millennium, um, since my bachelor days, um, when I was doing a Bachelor of Engineering in Computer Science. And graphs are a very interesting topic, which have sort of, you know, gained a lot of momentum, especially in the 20s, in the, you know, that was called sort of the decade or the year of graphs, 2018. And before Ontotext, I was part, I was a research analyst at Gartner. I wrote a lot of articles and published a lot of papers around uh, data engineering, data management, uh, areas around stream processing, time series databases, graph databases, and all that. So I'm very interested in knowledge graphs and the power of knowledge graphs, and that's what brought me to Ontotext. I've been with Ontotext about six months now. So with that said, um, let me ask you a question, right? Uh, with, to show you the power of graphs, right? Take any celebrity you know, right? Any celebrity you know, and on the other end of the spectrum, take any person in a remote island, remote tribe, right? With, on a planet of eight billion people now, how many connections do you think you need to connect these two people at two ends of the spectrum? Any, any guesses? Uh, one. One? <laughs> yeah, one is the minimum, but the average, and that's the best case, but the average is actually six, right? It's called Six Degrees of Freedom. Um, there's a book written by Kevin, Kevin Bacon on this, on this topic, and it's very hard to imagine. Pl planet of eight billion people and the average number of connections to go from one extreme to the other is just, is just six, right? And that's why you, I think I would recommend you all to see this, this particular documentary on Netflix called Connected. We are, ev we, all of us are very highly connected some way or the other, right? And this documentary shows, shows the power of graphs, right? When you hear about data scientists, right? Data scientists are always data hungry, right? They're always looking for more data. Why? Because they want to get more signals from the data, right? They want to put together all the connections, right? Relational databases, right? Relational database to me is sort of an oxymoron. Relational databases, yes, they can manage relations, but you know, any social media company you take, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, they did not implement their systems with relational technology. They had to write their own graph databases to, because social media is all about connections, right? One of the famous um, things that made graph even more famous way back in 2016 was, um, was an analysis of a lot of the papers, text, to connect, to figure out how a lot of the rich people were siphoning money into banks, into, into banks outside their countries. And there was a team of journalists who used graph databases to figure out the connections and how the money was being, how the money was getting laundered, laundered, right? And you will see today, a lot of the fraud detection technologies that, that financial organizations continuously use, use graphs under the cover because Fraud detection with plain machine learning reached a threshold. And fraudsters, you know, are always outsmarting, right? And graphs provided that extra insights where, because fraudsters typically work as cohorts, as clusters, right? So a lot of financial organizations use graph technologies to figure out, um, to figure out fra fraud, fraud detection, right? So graph technologies are all around us. The device you're holding is, is using graphs, right? It has social media. The moment you use GPS, you are using graphs. The road connections, the road intersections are the nodes, and the road themselves are the, the edges, right? Any, you know, whenever you, you are using cell phones, right, as you're, as you're moving, as the connection goes from one cell phone tower to the other, they use graph technology under the cover to, to map it, right? Supply chain is all about graphs. Bill of materials, all about graphs. There are numerous ex examples, right? In computer science, for those of you who are from computer science, relational databases use deadlock detection technologies, right? When there is deadlocks, we are trying to modify the same data together concurrently. They use graphs to figure out if there is a cycle, and then they kick out one of the one of the links to resolve the deadlocks. Right? Compilers are using graph data structures under the cover. So graphs are actually all around us. 
Knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs are one level higher than graphs. Graph is just a graph database where you have, where, where you figure out the connections, where you map your connections from the data as nodes and as edges and as attributes. But knowledge graphs go one level deeper. The term knowledge graphs was actually sort of uh, popular. The, the term knowledge graph was popularized by, by Google when in 2012, Google changed its algorithm from using inverted index to using knowledge graphs. So when you Google, or use any search engine for that matter of fact, right? If you search for a dentist, right? If you search for a dentist, Google will give you oral surgeons. They will give you orthodontists. How does Google know that dentists and orthodontists are related, right? It's a subclass of it and it uses a knowledge graph. Google has an extensive knowledge graph, which is not publicly available. Google uses its own. But these are other knowledge graphs that are sort of publicly available. Most big companies today use knowledge graphs extensively. Take JP Morgan Chase, take eBay. They have all knowledge graphs under the cover to bring out more inherent relationships. The unknown unknowns, right? That is a very difficult thing. The known knowns can be figured out easily. The unknown knowns can be figured out, but the unknown unknowns are very difficult to figure out. That is where knowledge graphs comes in. And these are sort of the different, just a handful of examples here, right? The moment you use, as I said, any search engine you use, you'll use a knowledge graph. Moment you use things like CD assistance or Alexa and things like that, they use knowledge graphs. All the banks, Right? They, do not, they, they use what is called KYC. I call it kill your, kill your customer. They, they ask you for so much information that you are exasperated. Right? But KYC under the cover uses, uses knowledge graphs because now you are getting data from so many different sources and now you have to integrate them meaningfully. That meaningfully is the part where knowledge graph becomes very important, the semantics associated with you. And I'll use two terms very extensively here, ontologies and taxonomies. And I'll, I'll show you what, there is a gentleman here who has already worked with ontologies. But what are ontologies and taxonomies? That is what is the DNA and RNA for a knowledge graph, which is built on top of a graph database. So knowledge graphs require a graph database, but it's the things on top of it that gives you the meaning and the context, right? So there are basically two forms of graphs, right? LPG graphs, you know, it's not liquefied petroleum gas, it's like labeled property graph. Very simple to understand. The advantage of graphs is the way you model it, it's very intuitive. The way your brain thinks, the way you whiteboard it, graph becomes much more, much more easy to model. For those of you who have done relational databases again, right? In relational, if you have to do a simple many-to-many -many relationship, right? Many products, many suppliers. You cannot do it in relational, right? You have to break it down. You have to have an association table which does the M to N mapping and then one to N mapping, right? And that association table has no meaning in real life, right? It's extra burden on, on a join as well as on the conceptual side, right? That's where graphs come in. You can model the way your brain thinks, right? And this is a labeled property graph where you have nodes, nodes have attributes, and then you have nodes are connected by edges, edges have attributes. Very simple for brain to understand, right? You are in this conference, right? You're going from one room to the other, right? Your brain internally is using a graph. Each of the rooms are nodes, and the corridors and passageways are all the, the connections, right? So graphs are, graphs are omnipresent, right? This is an example from Ontotext's website where how you can prepare a pizza. There's a small error there, but uh, overlook that. How you can model a pizza with its different ingredients, right? And each ingredient has its own attributes, right? It can be delivered and all these things. So th this is the way to model, right? You cannot escape modeling. You still have to do the modeling. What is a node? What is a relationship? What are the attributes, right? And then, this is where the real fun begins. This is what is called as an RDF, Resource Description Framework, right? Resource Description Framework is another way to model a graph, another way to model. The advantage of this is you break your statements, your facts, into the most granular form, right? Socrates is a man, right? you break it into a way as subject, object, and predicate. That's the simplest form. 
And when you break your facts into a simple form, as in an RDF, it, it definitely explodes the amount of data you have to store, but it gives you that extra capability of reasoning. Socrates is a man, all men are mortal. Sumit is a man, we can find out that Sumit is mortal too. Knowledge graphs can help you to deduce that new fact because now you have modeled your data in the most granular form and that gives you that extra power. LPG graphs, let me quickly go back, right? LPG graphs have one big disadvantage and any LPG graph can be converted to an RDF graph or an RDF can be converted, only the size differs, right? But when you use a GPS, right, you want to go from one point to another point when you're walking or driving a car, right? Typically, LPG graphs are used because graph algorithms, there are so many graph algorithms out there, right? When you do a Google search with, um, with page rank algorithm, right? Page rank is basically an influencer sort of an algorithm, which, which node in this whole connected thing is the most influential, where all connections go through. Google will put it at the top, apart from the knowledge graph part of the query. So LPG graphs are mostly used for graph analytics, for graph traversal. But RDF graphs are very much more powerful for doing semantics, because it's breaking it up into so much granularity that making meaning and modeling your domain into those conceptual granular level is much more simpler, right? And this is the same pizza example now with an RDF model. And what you can also do here is, see on the top left is recipes, right? Or allergies. What sort of allergy? You can get allergy ontology, allergy taxonomy, and in and sort of overlay it on top of your graph to get much more information. And these kind of ontologies and taxonomies, which we will see, are publicly available. You could create your own domain-specific ontology or taxonomy, but you can also use other publicly available taxonomies or ontologies, which are written in standards. That is the advantage of knowledge graphs and RDFs. They are very standardized. The formats are very standardized, which makes it very interoperable. You can quickly import, just like in a, if you're writing a C code or a Java code and you do imports, right? You can import these, these ontologies. One more thing I wanted to show you. Each, each subject predicate and each subject object and predicate that you have, each of them have unique identifiers, which are globally unique. That way you resolve ambiguity. So knowledge graphs are very useful, especially in data management, when you do entity resolution, entity disambiguation, where you want to adhere to standards. For example, date, today we hear about terms like data mesh, where data contracts are, need to be established between data producers and data consumers. Data contracts can be modeled as a knowledge graph, saying, I want this data to be in this form with these types, right? So I think I sort of said, what, what, is, what is a knowledge graph, right? It's a graph under the cover, it's a graph database. And, under, and, um, under the, and on top of the graph database is your ontologies and taxonomies, where, you, where you're modeling your facts. And that gives you that inferencing and reasoning power, right? Typically, this is how a knowledge graph, one high level way of building a knowledge graph. Give it any content, especially unstructured content, right? When you have unstructured content, most organizations, 75, 80% of the data is unstructured. Unstructured meaning video, audio, most importantly, text data, right? Text data has become so important now with chat GPT and all, all, all these technologies, right? 80% of the data in an organization is unstructured in form of emails, blogs, your PDF documents, document files, right? A knowledge graph can extract out the entities from different documents in your, in your organizational's data repository and then interlink them. That's why knowledge graphs are very used, highly, highly used in the chemical industry, in the drug discovery industry. Ontotext specializes in life science and finance, as well as in energy sector, as well as in things like digital twins and IoT. The reason is, especially in, 
in energy and in finance, there are a lot of regulatory requirements, right? And a lot of these regularity, regularity and compliance are embedded in text where meaning can be very disambiguous. You need to make sure that your meanings are correct. And that's where knowledge graphs are. So you can extract out these, you can then build the connections through entity linking, through semantic enrichment with providing the ontology and the taxonomy, build the knowledge graph, and then through that you can do classification, comprehension, recommendation, and things like that, right? So knowledge graph has three inputs, right? Your basic raw data, your ontology, which could be very domain specific. BBC uses, BBC uses knowledge graphs for sports, for wildlife, they use it for one more thing, I forget. They, they use it pretty extensively to, to make sure that your, the classification, categorization of the news and things like that are very well defined. <clears throat> so the advantages of a knowledge graph is reusable. It's reusable <clears throat> because, as I said, you could reuse ontologies. There are a lot of ontologies that are available, right? Financial has a financial domain has a very well-known ontology called FIBO, right? Where all financial terms, their interrelationships are already defined. And these ontologies and taxonomies, they are also, the fun is, they are also modeled as a graph. They are also modeled as a graph. So when you overlay that ontology graph on top of your data graph, it becomes much more, as you saw in the pizza example, if you overlay the allergy or the recipe graph on top of it, it gets much richer. It gets semantically much more meaningful, right? Data integration, you hear about the topic data fabric, right? Data fabric is very common, where, again, I wouldn't say it's very common, but it's a term, there is, there is a lot of, there are these buzzwords always floating around, right? But data fabric is basically an integration layer, and under the cover, data fabric uses knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs are very powerful for data integration coming from different data silos. As I said, 360, data coming from different areas and you need to meaningfully tie them together, right? Reasoning, Socrates is a man, the example I gave, it can quickly figure out new facts for you, right? Standards, all these ontologies and taxonomies have to be written in specific languages, in specific formats, so that it's interoperable, right? Now, I have a lot of slides here. The reason I added, I know I won't be able to cover them in the 40 minutes, but this is for you to reference as well. There are a lot of standards and a lot of products that are used for ontologies and taxonomy building that you can later reference for, for, your, own, um, um, for your own use, right? So discovering the unknown unknowns, right? Um, intermediate hops, right? When you do a friend of friend, right, in, in, in social media or any link, right? It's, it's basically doing a graph traversal, going from one node to the other and then going to the other, right? And you can go to any depth, right? There is a similar terminology like we use for, um, you know, searching. It's called the page rank algorithm for searching. You, we have another term called graph rank, which allows you to figure out what is the ranking for a particular node. Providing semantics for the concepts. So you can use knowledge graphs in enterprise setting, which makes, which there is a terminology called enterprise knowledge graphs. Enterprise knowledge graphs can help you to model to your specific domain. If you are in the energy domain, right, you can use op publicly available energy ontologies and import it, right? Especially in the oil and gas or in the electrical, or in the electrical industry, where there are so many standards, right? Let's say two pipes are getting connected and the, each of these pipes have different standards on which they need to be on, on which they need to be operating the temperature their width depth all, all those sort of things when you have constructed it you need to validate it when you have made an architecture you need to validate it and knowledge graphs can help you to validate that because all those standards can be expressed as owls um, uh, as, as ontologies or taxonomies which are again very standard so with enterprise knowledge graphs, you can help to organize your knowledge domain. So this is a mind map, which I think I've sort of covered. What are the different use cases for knowledge graphs? It could be used in the data management, especially very rich, especially very good in the content management space, where you have content that needs to be uh, parsed out, the entities need to be extracted, and then interrelated, right? Knowledge graphs are also used in ML explainability today. Let's say you have given a picture, right? How do you figure out that th this picture is telling you a story or telling you an information? You can use knowledge graphs. We've all heard about LLMs. We're all overdosed with noise about LLMs, right? LLMs hallucinate, and we at Ontotext have developed techniques to make sure your hallucinations could be minimized because now the output of the LLMs can be validated from a knowledge graph, right? The other way works also. 
you can create a no creation of a knowledge graph is very challenging and that's why there is a steep learning curve to it right but now you can use llms you provide your ontologies as prompts to an llm and llm can generate a knowledge graph for you with that ontology that you pass as a prompt right so these are the different use cases and there are there are many more use cases of graphs and 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 knowledge graphs right so typically a knowledge graph stack would be would be something like this you have the data integration layer have, that's the raw data that's the raw material right you have to bring data from different sources you parse it out you create that subject object and predicate right which i said earlier on you create you store it in graph db or any graph database that you have and then you apply your ontologies and taxonomies to build that semantic layer on top of the semantic layer if you want you can have reasoning reasoning works in two different ways forward chaining and backward chaining depending on your query time and latency you need different engines use different ways graph database uses forward chaining when you ingest the data it makes sure all the information is valid and when you are querying it results come very quickly right and then you have the query layer you can query it in multiple ways you can query through apis sparkle is the language for querying it's a lot like sql but here you can it but here you can query your rdf database you can use llms to query as well you know like you can use llms to validate your queries a lot of times queries become very complex and llms can ex provide explanation to to your queries and you can you also use graphql to do that and then you can build applications um, semantic applications on top of it using using the query layer so this is a pretty long stack there's a lot of things in each of the layers right but at a high level this is what happens in a knowledge graph right so what are the main components you need as i said knowledge graphs need three things right your raw material the raw materials which which is which is the doc, which is the data that you have you have the ontology and taxonomy either you can import it from public sources or you can import it from public sources and customize it for your own domain a lot of the ontology taxonomy tools provide provide you ways to do that so taxonomy and ontology are sort of the rna and dna for building your knowledge graphs you need a graph database you need a vocabulary right what is the glossary or the terms the business terms that your domain is using you need a data mapping framework onto text for example provides a way to integrate with your relational databases and bring in your relational data as a graph but it needs that layer the mapping framework to map the components from relationals schema to your to 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 your ontologies taxonomies and to your knowledge graph schema right and you need of course data data extraction tools so taxonomy you know we all have been using taxonomy since we were we were 2 years or 3 years old right a think of taxonomy as a way to classify things right and i'll show you an example which probably will make more sense take an example of when you do machine learning right Mach machine learning model performance has a lot of different ways of doing measuring performance right of a machine learning model and these can be classified into different ways so it's basically a classification then you have a data right data can be nested data data can be in any form C csv format parquet format other format so and there are also these public taxonomies available nasa uses knowledge graphs taxonomies ontology extensively they have to right to make sure that things are more valid the other thing uh, knowledge graphs are very much used is in data validation because your data follows a certain taxonomy and ontology you can quickly validate your data you know a lot of organizations talk about not talk about ai and machine learning without having good data right it's it's all garbage in garbage out without you do without doing you know good data quality your machine learning algorithms are not really useful for business and knowledge graphs can step in and uh, at ontotex we have implemented this for a lot of europe a lot of european energy companies to validate their data and found out that a lot of the data has has um, you know violated some some regulations and compliance and things like that so going back so so ta taxonomy is basically a way of classifying information typically as a hierarchy it's sort of a knowledge map right now and that's the foundation for doing a lot of semantic search for doing a lot of discovery metadata tagging faceting things like that findability right most organizations build data lakes right 
bring in data. We'll f then f let's first bring in data and then we'll figure out what to do with it, right? That's totally the wrong approach, right? And that's why first generation data lakes all fail because became data swamps. Biggest problem with data lakes was findability. You could not semantically find your data. Who brought what data when? What are the data quality profiles? How can I use it? Who is using it? That's where you know, findability becomes very important, especially with knowledge graphs, more semantic, semantically able to find them, right? You see how am I doing on time? Okay. These are some of the taxonomy standards, right? Standards are the most important part about knowledge graphs, right? Dr. Tim Berners-Lee has been talking about it since the late 90s, right? Semantic web, that still hasn't happened yet, right? But that's the idea, where we are not doing searching with strings, right? Because strings are characters. Characters are just zeros and ones. But we are doing searching with things, right? Which are concepts, right? That's the whole idea about the semantic web. And, they, and when you develop taxonomies, you follow these standards. That makes your taxonomy interoperable, reusable across different departments within your organization, right? And most of the tools follow these, fo follow these standards, right? Remember earlier when I said RDFs, right? Subject, object, predicate. Subject, object, predicate, each of them have unique identifiers. So you can uniquely identify is a relationship, has a relationship, right? Composed of relationships. Because now they are unique, your knowledge graph engine can quickly give you semantics that this is related to this. If you if you understand that, that's one of the core things to understand. It has, unif it, it has standardization, and that gives it that reusability power, the power to do inferring, right? These are a lot of taxonomy tools. Um, there, there are ontology tools. There is this very, very well-known tool called Protege from Stanford University, very usable, especially those of you who have, um, you know, background in object-oriented development, um, analysis and design and development, you'll find it very easy to use, a lot of it falls into that category where you have classes, subclasses, superclasses, is a subclass of things like that. It, it's, it's very much like that. It's not exactly, taxonomies and ontology are not exactly like that, but it gives you a good way to start and get your head wrapped around, right? But taxonomies have problems, right? When you have poly hierarchies, multiple hierarchies, right? One thing belonging to multiple. Just like object-oriented design has challenges when you have multiple inheritance, right? Poly hierarchies cause problems. When you, have nest, when, when you have nested data, that's fine. And oftentimes, very strict hierarchies limit your conceptual orientation. You may have one object could belong to multiple hierarchies. Happens in real life, right? In real life, things are like that. Taxonomies become limited. And that's where ontologies come in and, and provide you much more depth, right? So think about ontology as, think about ontology as your schema for your graph data, right? It provides a schema. Now, you may be a little confused here saying, you know, okay, we had relational databases which were very schema oriented and then we had that non-relational databases, right? Like key values, graphs, time series and all that. Now, typically the advantage which has been said of NoSQL databases is, you know, they are schema agnostic. But again, at some point in time, you will have to put a schema on everything to get meaning, meaning out of it. So the ontology provides you that schema. And again, ontologies and taxonomies, remember that, are also modeled as graph elements, as subject, object, and predicate, right? Everything is a, everything is a graph here, right? Sorry. The other thing about ontology is this is what helps you to minimize ambiguity. Once you have an ontology on top of, of your data, you can quickly figure out what belongs to which class, to which, to which um, hierarchy, to which categorization, right? And it's all, it's all very formal. It's all very formal. And that's the beauty of doing knowledge graphs is everything is machine readable. Everything is machine readable. And the machine, the engine, the graph database engine, Ontotex graph database engine, or any other graph database engine can automatically figure out your data validations, your, which, your elements, where it belongs to, 
because it's all machine readable. It's what is called, we use the term IRI. I forget the exact full um, um, ex expansion of that term, but it's a lot like URIs, universal um, resource identifiers, right? Uh, it's internationalized. It's, it's international um, resource identifiers, right? So it's global, it's standard, right? That gives it a machine readable capability. So you can automate, you can automate your data validations, you can automate a lot of the um, generation part of, um, of your knowledge graphs. And now with this ontology, once you have an ontology, you know in big enterprises, different departments have ambiguities in terms of meaning, in terms of data, what is the data type that is going to come, all that. But with an ontology, if you have a good shared ontology, it can help you to make it more shareable. Data sharing, right? Data sharing is what a lot of the cloud vendors are doing now, data exchanges, they call data marketplaces, right? These, these are based on data contracts and you can leverage knowledge graphs on top of it to, or, or the knowledge graph is the engine under, underneath it to make sure that your data that is incoming is according to a specification, according to a contract, using, using the right kind of ontologies, right? So basically it's the blueprint, right? Ontology gives you the blueprint, it gives you the semantic type capabilities uh, for relations as well as for your entities. It gives you that common, basically the common data model, a shareable, a shareable data model. And that makes it interoperable, right? Again, I think I already talked about all this. We don't have to go through this. Um, yeah, we're doing good on time. So think about ontologies as a schema, right? And I'll, I think I have an example below, which will give you the type of the class to which that concept belongs. Each concept has different properties and concepts are interrelated, right? So now you can have different types of relationships, right? I have a relationship to my spouse. I have a relationship to my son or daughter, right? So the relationships can be different types and uh, ontology can help you to specify that. The other part is what are called constraints. Constraints are when you, yeah, when you specify these these schema you specify, like, like in relational, you specify constraints, that value for this field has to be between this and this. Very similar to this, right? It's specified in this, again, a standard language called shackle, shape constraint language. Pretty easy language, not, not, not very difficult. It, it tells you that a particular data type has to be within these classes or within multiple classes or within these values and things. That helps you to do data validation. You have a shackle engine that can read shackle and make sure that your data is valid. And then there is the, the taxonomy, which is more concepts, classes, and the hierarchies, right? So this is what the core components of an ontology looks like, right? What are the classes? What are the properties, sub-properties? Properties can also have sub-properties and super-properties, which they inherit from, and it defines all that, right? You see there is a relationship, right? Is mother of relationship. Each of these relationships have unique identifiers. And for, for, for a given standard, right? And that gives knowledge graphs that additional power to quickly interpret, do inferencing, and reasoning. Ontology best practices for big organizations, don't try to build a whole ontology for the organization first. You know, start small, right? Like, right? That's a mantra, start small, have big ideas, yes, but start small, iterate, and refine. Same with ontologies, you, the, the, the tools out there are, are pretty good now. They are well matured to help you. And also don't start from scratch when you're building ontologies. Import, import existing outside ontologies which are available in the public domain. And then do, do, do changes to it. Remove things that you don't need now, right? Just like the way you, you, you do it for, for everything. You, in, you import a template and then you make changes to it, customize it, right? A lot of ontology tools and libraries, Ontotext partners. Ontotext is not an end-to-end -end knowledge graph product. We integrate with partners, with partners who help us to, in, in, to integrate data from external sources, to build the ontologies, to do the visualization of the graph. We have our own visualization, but we also integrate with other external visualization tools, the graph visualization tools. But we have the core graph database to bring in your data to model it in, as RDFs, and then the RDF, and the RDF engine or the graph engine to do inferencing and 
uh, reasoning. A lot of well-known ontologies. Some of the ones that I've, I've highlighted are very, are very well-known. There is almost an ontology in anything you can think about, right? So when you are starting to build your knowledge graph, you don't have to start from scratch. You can import these and start, and start using them, right? These are some ontology, ontology standards to provide some of the things like Shackle, as I said, provides you automatic data validation. Specify your data, specify your data um, uh, specifications as Shackle and, and import it into the GraphDB engine and can figure out if your data is valid or not valid, right? And these, these are certain questions to ask before you start building on your knowledge graph, right? What, what are, do I need to build an enterprise-wide knowledge graph? Do I, uh, you know, how is the knowledge shared? How is my data refreshed? On a regular on, on, on a regular basis, right? Yeah, I have five minutes more. I think I have a few more slides. Um, yeah, these are some of the questions you should ask when you start building a knowledge graph. Especially, start building it in a departmental unit and collaborate with the domain specialists. When you build a knowledge graph, you need domain specialists for your particular domain, right? And this is how you typically go about building a knowledge graph. You have data virtualization, which is on the top left. You bring in the data for data, you're doing your data processing and enrichment. You do the schema mapping. And on this side are all these different things we talked about to build the model, to build the model repository, and then generate, and then generate the graph on top of it. Begin with a single use case, identify which, identify where your contents are, import it with the right kind of um, uh, data in integration tools, and then reuse, reuse your ontologies, define your ontologies and taxonomies first. And then you can, you know, there is a well-known, um, there is also a well-known tool called R2RDF, which is relational to RDF, which can bring in data from relational technologies, relational databases into a graph data, RDF graph database engine. So that's a data integration tool that you can use too. I talked about this. You can use LLMs to build your knowledge graphs by giving it an ontology as a prompt. Again, when you do ontologies, these are some of the questions you should be asking. Can I reuse? Don't typically, don't go and build ontologies yourself. Reuse and involve your SMEs, domain experts, right? And this is how you go about building an ontology, right? Typically model nouns as concepts and verbs as relationships, right? Define the different facets as attributes, right? Define your classes, superclasses, subclasses to which your concepts could belong to, right? These are some of the well-known knowledge graph platform vendors Ontotext, Cambridge Semantics, Stardog, and, and these. Um, Ontotext is the only one which has a benchmarked, a worldwide benchmark standard graph database engine. Most of the other, other vendors do not have a benchmark in terms of performance when you're doing these, these graph queries, these graph analytic queries. Querying, as I said earlier, you, there are different ways. There are ways in which you can query with SQL as well, SQL to Spark, Sparkle Converter. You can query DBpedia because it has a Sparkle endpoint. You can, if you know Sparkle, you can just query DBpedia and get, get your answers. We also have an endpoint for certain example demos that we have. If you're interested, I can give it to you. Mm, and yeah, most of the things are, most of the things are with Sparkle or, or GraphQL nowadays with, with, with knowledge graph querying. Knowledge Graph is not a one-off engineering project. You do, it reg you do it as a mode of an iterative, start small and iterate and, 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 and bring in different data sets, ensure that you have the right ontologies, right? Typically, don't do Knowledge Graphs each component. Go for a platform. Go for a company that gives you the full platform. Otherwise, you will struggle. Yeah, you can do it with open source, right? Putting things together. But that's a problem in the cloud too, right? Cloud vendors give you all services, then you have to stitch it together, right? It's a huge integration effect, effort, right? Typically go with, plat go with platform vendors. Yeah, these are certain guidelines that you, can, that you can refer to as you go and build your knowledge. So with that, I will end and thank you for being very good listeners and um, thank you for joining. Hope this was useful, but if you have questions, you can ask them now or I'm here. Let me see if it goes back.
Thank you. Oh, the next one? You, you, you can download them as well. All these slides are available. Yes, please. Hi. You can go ahead. So I had a question about the general approach. About what approach? About the general approach of using general knowledge. Approach, uh -huh. So um, what do you think about like these new statistic-based methods that are coming, you take in the raw data, and then you can directly query and ask questions from the raw data without having these intermediate knowledge graphs. As people are investing more time and energy into creating those statistics-based method, do you think they can ever reach a point where um, like, they can compare with knowledge graphs? There is a lot of research going on in this, especially as you say about LLMs, right? LLMs are basically statistic, statistical generated, probability generated, what is coming next, right? It does, but the challenge is with hallucinations, right? You cannot, you have to, you have to do, you probably like our CEO said, you may have to take a liability insurance before you start using LLMs widely across your, um, you know, data engineering, because you don't know what it is correct. Yeah, it could be 90% correct, but in data engineering, you typically want 100% and that's where knowledge graphs can complement uh, LLM, the output of LLM fed to a knowledge graph, verified, and then you feed it to your automated system or to your continuous deployment, right? That's the direction we see things are going. It's more complementing each other rather than competing. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the parent relationship. So can you express these relationship with like more general rules? Like can I say that parent of a parent is a grandparent or sibling of a sibling or? Okay, so I can express it like a more, it's not just individual instances, but based on classes and rules. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so I understand you would have like an ontology before you take some unstructured data to create a graph out of it, and the ontology will dictate how the graph gets created. But the problem with unstructured data is how do you know where are the entities? And I've personally had to deal with this a lot. Like we would first pass that data through an NER or something, and then it's kind of like a chicken egg problem, right? Like the NER could just not be as accurate. It is, it, it is. And that's where how precise your ontology is dictates to a certain extent how precise your outputs are in terms of identifying, identifying the entities, yeah. So those can be automated very well in certain domains, right? where after usage, it improves. It, because knowledge graphs also, under the cover, are using machine learning algorithms, right? So they are using it. So it improves over time, right? It improves more as it learns about the domain concepts and things like that. It's a mix. It's a mix of ontology as well as how precise your machine learning algorithms are to really get to that precision level that is 100% correct. You don't need a human in the loop, um, kind of. That's what where your question was, right? Yeah. 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 Understandable, very good question. That's a very good, very bad.